Good morning, everyone. Welcome back from Thanksgiving weekend. Trust you got your fill of turkey or whatever your protein of choice is on such a day as that. Anyway, it was a it's nice to have a, a long weekend. And um, I always feel like starting on Tuesdays of the week is like I'm, if you've ever driven a standard vehicle, try to start in second gear. Uh, you can do it, but you better have clutch and gas ready and just whoop, away you go. Thanks, Providence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have to pay you for your, for your involvement. Okay, uh, Tuesdays, uh, this week in chapel, Tuesdays, we'll continue on with our series, Did Not Our Hearts Burn, and uh, Mark will introduce our speaker in just a little bit. Tomorrow is, Wednesday, is service on Wednesday, and then impact groups on Thursday, and then we do have an assembly on Friday at 10, Irresistible Christianity. So come and find out about that, and then next Monday... Um, is the Way Chapel. I think you should welcome your student union president. Thanks, guys. Good morning. Um, happy late Thanksgiving. Um, okay, just a few reminders today. Um, Wednesday morning prayer tomorrow morning, 8.30 in the loft. As usual, yes, let's go, Andrew. Um, Wednesday night worship, um, 8 p.m. tomorrow, same day. Um, and then a reminder, Thursday. What's happening on Thursday? Okay, so you didn't need a reminder. Okay, it's, um, it's going to take place in the Maxwell between 7 and 9 p.m. So do come out and enjoy. <laughs> Sounds suspicious to me. Uh, a little while ago, Jillian sent out an email about baptism. And if you want more information or are interested in being baptized, uh, please send an email to either Jillian or Michael, and they'll uh, get back to you. Okay, as we begin chapel this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand. And I want to read from... Lamentations chapter 3, a couple of verses that are very familiar for us. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. Uh, this day. We are grateful for having a long weekend. We are grateful for seeing friends and family and just taking a break from our regular routine. We are also grateful that we get to come back and to enter back into routine. Thankful that we can come to a place, to a community, where others, we are surrounded by others who love you, want to serve you, we want to become more like your son, our Savior, Jesus. So would you help us in that? We thank you that because of your great love for us and your faithfulness to us, we are a blessed people. Would you accept the praise that we bring this day in Christ's name? Amen.
Thank you, Danae and Emma and team. We appreciate your work. So I missed Community Chapel last week. I'm going to blame Mark Jonah. He led me astray. Together we went to Ottawa carrying our flag. I think it was worth our time. If there's a Christian in the room, I bring you greetings from Father Bob. That would be a Zimmer. Warm greetings to you. We had a wonderful time with your dad. Um, and then uh, I wanted to talk about one other meeting that Mark and I had, and that was with a guy named Garnet Genuus, who is an MP out of Edmonton. Bob Zimmer is an MP out of the Peace River area. And then we went and saw Garnet Genuus. Uh, and um, Garnet talked about wanting and needing more digital media experts in Ottawa. They would like to put together 10 internships for us. So if you are in the digital media program and would like to spend a little bit of time in Ottawa, perhaps building a portfolio of excellent experience telling stories on video or social media, this is an opportunity for you. Please talk to Mark Jonah. <laughs> Um, and we'll see if we can't make that happen. And um, if any of you are looking for switches in program, that is an amazing career there. And the doors are now open for us in Ottawa through them. Our guest this morning is, is Evans Hundermark. Evans comes to us from the Lower Mainland. He works with the E Free Church of Canada, who have also thrown their doors open to us. Um, specifically from our pulpit ministries tracks, worship arts and youth ministry and pastoral studies. So if you're in any of those tracks, I want to encourage you, invite you to connect with Evans. He's hanging around here for a couple of days. I'm not sure exactly how many days this week, but it would be lovely if all of you who are receiving the E-Free Scholarship, oh, there's an E-Free Scholarship, yes. For those of you who aren't, talk to him. For those of you who are, be sure that you ask him if you can join him for lunch. He'll buy his own lunch. I'm not worried about you having to pick up his lunch or dinner. Um, but um, if you can connect with him, I think that would be wonderful for you to help us show our prairie hospitality. I'd also love it if you would give a hand to the E-Free and say thank you to them for opening their doors to us. Would you welcome Evans here? <clears throat> yeah, come on up. But you can't have the mic quite yet. Evans has four kids, Caleb, Kelsey, Gabby, and Jody. Kelsey is married to Noah, and they have one grandkid, Aurora Rose. He's served and pastored churches in South Africa, Zimbabwe, BC, Alberta over the last 30 years. And he studied at the Cape Town Baptist Seminary in Cape Town, South Africa. Now that would be an interesting place to go to study. I don't want to encourage any of you to leave here, but if you're ever looking for a place to go study, go to Cape Town. It's amazing. And uh, now he's um, representing the E-Free here on campus. Kelly will probably want to connect with him as well. But anyway, let me pray for you, and then we'll get to work. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the friendship that you're building between us and the E-Free. I ask that we would serve the church well, and I ask that we would especially serve the Evangelical Free Church of Canada well. Help us to show great hospitality. Help us to show your love. Help us to show your compassion for the work that they're doing in the many places across this great country. We pray that you would bless Evans, overwhelm him with your spirit so that he can be a blessing to us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you, Mark.
Thank you, and thank you for that warm welcome. Wow, yeah, it really is good to be here. I was born in Zimbabwe, which if you're looking at a map of Africa, is towards the southern part, but not quite all the way there. And so I decided, well, I'm almost at the bottom. I might as well go to the bottom. And so I went to Cape Town. You can't get any further south than that. And I went to Cape Town Baptist Seminary there. And I am on record at Cape Town Baptist Seminary for being one of the only students that completed a four-year degree course in five years. I'm a slow learner, and it took me a little bit of time. I've had the, the amazing privilege, and it is a privilege, to serve God as a in a missionary capacity in Zimbabwe and pastored in South Africa and uh, even here in Southern Alberta for a short while in a little, a little village called Foremost. So if you head south, you get to the border, you've gone too far, far, just back up a few kilometers and you'll find this little village called Foremost. And I was there for about five or six years. And now I'm back in Chilliwack in, in the lower mainland, uh, the promised land. Um, we've, we've finally made it there. Um, actually, the lower mainland of, of the evangelical, uh, sorry, the lower Pacific district of the evangelical free church is a wonderful place to serve God. We've got about 37 to 40 churches. I say that because we've got a few church plants that are going on. One of them is called Sunflower. It's an English-speaking Korean church. Um, and we've got another one called the Reality and Divinity of Jesus Christ Church. Um, and, and a few others with some just as glorious names as that. Um, and it's really exciting to be a part of what God is doing there. We have about 125 pastors in our district in those 37 churches. Some of them serve small churches, 20 to 30 people. Others are uh, pastor churches of about 4,000 people. And so I get to travel a lot. I get to, to visit a lot. I get to see a whole lot of different things. One of the most amazing things is is that in the lower Pacific district, um, God is worshiped every Sunday by seven different cultures and in nine different languages. And so I get these amazing opportunities to go in and uh, greet some of the churches and uh, they greet me back and we don't know what we're saying to each other, but we just know it's glorifying to God in some way. Well, they're smiling and I'm smiling, so it must be glorifying uh, to God in some way. And we've got some great opportunities that have opened up there in the worship arts, uh, in pastoring, youth pastoring. In fact, we're experimenting at the moment. We've got a number of small Small churches on remote islands off of uh, the main island that are looking for pastors and they can't afford a pastor. And so we're looking at, at some creative ways of providing a pastor that will be kind of a, a circuit missionary traveling pastor that will oversee three or four congregations um, and minister to, to these people on, on these different islands. So if you're interested, please do come and see me. I am around for a couple of days and would love to speak to you. I should introduce my family. I have this amazing family. Thank you, Mark, for, for mentioning them. Um, uh, of special interest is the, the little girl in the middle, Bumpa's best friend. We get up to so much trouble together. And normally when she comes to visit, the first thing she does is grab Bumpa's hand and say, Bumpa, draw. And she knows that the draw next to my bed more likely than not is gonna have some candy in it. And so that's, that's the first uh, port of call when she comes to visit. The other person I really wanna mention in my family that is such an inspiration to not just myself, but my whole family is my wonderful wife, Donna. Did I hear that someone's name here was Donna on the worship team? Great name, great name. So I'm married to Donna, not that Donna. And, and, she, and she's a lifelong learner. She's got this heart and passion about studying and learning. In fact, a couple of years ago, she, she walked into the living room one night and she said, Evans, I've decided to become a paramedic. And there was this moment of awkward silence and I said, you do know that we're like 50, right? We should be talking about retirement. And she said, so what's your point? Well, I guess there was no point. And so she went on, she graduated top of her class. Um, she now works in Kamloops, Kelowna, different places in the lower mainland. And she's probably tuned in this morning when, when my tax money should be uh, generating some sort of uh, feedback there. But anyways, um, and she's now preparing to study for the next level of being a paramedic. And that's kind of gonna feed into, uh, into the, uh, what I'm wanting to talk about this morning. 
You're in the middle of this amazing series, Did Not Our Hearts Burn Within Us? And, and we kind of have been looking at Hebrews and, and working our way through Hebrews, which we suspect may have been or could have influenced or been influenced by the two disciples that walked with Jesus to Emmaus and how their hearts burned within them. And, and as I've been reading and preparing Hebrews, I, I've realized that you know, it's a really mysterious book. There's a lot of mystery that surrounds it. We don't really know who the actual author was. We can surmise, we can guess, um, uh, but we don't actually know. We don't know exactly when it was written. We, again, we can sort of take some guesses, um, and, uh, um, but we don't really know for sure. We also don't know who the, the original audience was intended to be. We don't know if it was written to a specific person, a group of people, if, whether it was meant to be a, a letter that was circulated for, for different churches to read, we don't know. And I think it's the sense of mystery that surrounds the book of Hebrews that just grabs our heart, makes it so appealing, and it draws us in and says, come on, got to study this, right? Well, as many uh, mysterious unknowns as there might be with, with the book of Hebrews, there are some things that we can know for sure things that we can be sure about. For, for instance, we know that it was written to primarily a Jewish audience. We don't know which specific church or group of people, but we do know that they were Jewish. We see this in the style of language, right? When the author writes, he's writing to people that understand the concept that he's addressing. So he speaks about the law and he speaks about Moses and he speaks about the, the sacrificial system and even angels and Melchizedek and he speaks about it as if it goes without saying that they understand what he's talking about. There's, there's no mystery, there's no need for explanation that, that would have been required if he was writing to a Gentile audience. So, so we, we're convinced that this was a Jewish audience that he's writing to and of course there's also the name of the book, right? It kind of gives it away a little bit and we do know, another thing that we can know about this book is the theme. The theme is clearly the supremacy of Jesus over all things. If the book of Hebrews is this beautiful tapestry, then Jesus is the scarlet thread that's woven through this tapestry and, and he's present in, 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 in every chapter and every verse on every page. It's all about Jesus. He's, he's more supreme than the, than the angels and the Lord, than Moses and the promised land and the sacrificial system that they were well aware about. And when we get into chapters four and five, we, we see that he's not just part of the priesthood, but rather he is our high priest who made propitiation for our sin as we heard last week from our, our speaker as we were skillfully reminded, the sinless high priest who entered the temple on our behalf. And as we read through the book of Hebrews, especially these opening chapters, we get the sense that the author is clearly excited about the subject, right? He's excited about Jesus. In fact, he, he starts off chapter five and, and verse 11, and he says this, he says, concerning this, and I, for some reason the line has jumped a little bit and crossed it out. That's the most important part I wanted to point out there. Uh, he's saying there's so much more that I wanna tell you about Jesus. He's been telling us about Jesus. He's, he's opened up Hebrews with this beautiful picture of Jesus as the radiant imprint and, and very nature of God. And, and he gets to chapter five, verse 11, and he says, there's so much more I wanna tell you about it. You, you get the sense that he's excited and passionate about his subject. In fact, it reminds me of in 1995 when they launched the Hubble telescope. And, and for the first time in history, we saw the stars, we saw galaxies, we saw the planets in a way we had never seen them before. It blew our minds. This was amazing. And then one of the scientists had this crazy idea. He said, let's just sort of focus the Hubble telescope into the darkest, most empty part of space just to see if maybe we've missed something, just to see if maybe there's something there that we, we, we didn't see. And so they, they turned it towards the Big Dipper, just above the handle of the Big Dipper, into this very dark, empty part of space, and they took a, a series of photographs. I think it was like something like 342 photographs over 10 days. And, and what came back absolutely blew their minds. In just that little square block of empty space, they discovered 3,000 new galaxies. 
all right? 3,000 new galaxies. In 2000, by 2009, they discovered another 10,000 more galaxies in that same little bit of space. And, and, and it's like we're, we're looking at space and, and it's so beautiful in these galaxies and these planets. It's like there's so much more I want to tell you in this little space here. God's saying, I want to show you some more things. And this is the kind of impression I get as, as we get into Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. I've discovered Jesus and it's beautiful and he's majestic and he's wondrous and he's glorious. In fact, there's so much more I want to tell you about him. But then there's a sudden downturn in his emotion. Concerning this, we've got so much to say, but I can't tell you. It's become difficult to explain because you've become sluggish in hearing. You can almost sense his disappointment. He says, I'm pumped to tell you more, but you're just not interested. I've got so much more I want to show you about Jesus, but you just don't want to hear. And this word sluggish, and if we look in the, uh, in the Greek, the, the actual Greek word is nothros. And in some versions of the, trans, of the Bible, we've, we've translated that as dull, okay? But I don't like that, that translation because the word dull kind of suggests that they're unable to hear. They don't have the ability to hear. And that's not true. As we read through the passage, that's not what he's saying. He's instead, what I like is the word sluggish because it suggests that they've become sluggish. They've slowed down. They've become apathetic. They've become lazy, it's not that they're unable to hear, but rather that they are unwilling to listen, unwilling to hear. And I want you to note that this is an, is an, is an intentional action. They've intentionally turned their back on Jesus, this glorious, wonderful picture that we've been painted already of Jesus. They've turned their back on it and they've started going back to the old, to legalism, to the law. They've, they've deliberately and intentionally slowed down and become apathetic. They've chosen not to hear. And so they are still immature. And when he says that they've become sluggish in the hearing, I want you to understand that that word hearing doesn't mean that they've grown deaf and they can no longer hear. It's not an auditory exercise, but rather they're hearing, but just not perceiving. They're hearing, but choosing to not understand. You remind, remember what James says, right? James chapter 1, Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word as well. They were hearing, but not doing. And so he goes on, and in, and in verse 12, he says to them, he says, for indeed, although at this time, you ought to be teachers. Now that word ought, I don't like it. Ophilo is the Greek word, and, and, and if we look at the proper translation here, the more accurate translation, it's obligated. It's not that they ought to be teachers, that it would be nice that if they were teachers or they could be teachers. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that because of what you've experienced with Jesus, because of all that you've heard and come to understand and see about Jesus, you should be obligated and compelled and driven to share these wonderful mysteries, these wonderful things. If your heart's burned within you, that burning should compel you to action. But instead of that, they had backed off. Instead of, of, of becoming teachers, instead they needed someone to teach them, to instruct them. You see, they have become in, uh, unacquainted with the message. They've, they've deliberately turned away and they've drifted, as your speaker said a couple of weeks back, they've drifted back to the law and they've rejected Jesus. It's an intentional action. I need you to see that. And what the author is trying to do here is he's trying to paint this ridiculous picture in the next few verses of how serious the situation is. And so he says to them, you're like babies requiring milk. Now, I know you look at that. My wife, when I was preparing this, looked at that and she said, oh, that's a, that's a freaky picture. I don't want to look at it. But that's the whole point. It's so ridiculous, it's so dumb, but this is what you've become. You've intentionally resisted the prime rib and you've gone back to a bottle of milk. And so what he does is he goes on and he says to them, you need to train yourselves. You need someone again to teach you the very basics of, 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 this, of, 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 of what we know about Jesus, the very basics of, of, of the Christian faith 
so that you can grow, so that you can be trained. And I love the word that he uses here, um, uh, the word trained there. It literally, the Greek word is gymnazo, and it literally means, uh, where, how should I say, it's where we get the word gymnast from or athlete from, all right? So think of training and teaching. You need someone to teach you the basics, instruct you so that you can take this teaching and apply it by training yourselves to to be what God has desired you to be, to be the teachers that you ought to be, that you should be. And so this, the idea here is this something that's very difficult, all right? If you look at a gymnast, I was watching a gymnast train um, for the Olympics not so long ago on this little four-inch balance beam, and she was doing these flips and these, these handstands and somersaults on this little four-inch beam, and I was like, wow, how do you do that? Well, what we don't see is the broken ribs and the broken collarbones and the bumps on the head and, and the falls and the, the tears of disappointment and, and despair that that gymnast gymnast goes through to reach this point. And it's the same thing in the Christian faith. My friends, Christianity is not for sissies. Do we use that word sissies in Canada? Is that a, is that a Canadian word? It's a South African word, all right? It's not for the weak. There we go. Christianity is for those that are willing to go through the bumps and the hardships and the trials and the difficulties of life so that we can win the prize so we can be shaped to be like Jesus more and more. Very quick story. Um, I preached a message on forgiveness and uh, I was really excited two weeks later to get this letter from this lady. And she, this is her story. She said, Evans, um, when I was in my 20s, I was manipulated and groomed into the sex trade and into the drug, drug addiction world. And she said, my boyfriend who became my pimp isolated me from everyone so much so that he took me to another country so that I couldn't have contact with any of my friends or family. And she said, that was my life for many years. I had a little baby with this pimp and, 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 and this was our life. And she said, as I look back on those years, I look back with so much shame, so much regret, so much anger and guilt. Um, because of, of what I went through. But she said, also with so much hate and anger towards that man. She said, I managed to escape from him after nearly 20 years, and I came back to Canada. And she said, um, I've been living here with my daughter all this time. She said, after you preached that message on forgiveness, she said, said, I felt so challenged. I felt like I needed to do something about it. And she said, I spent the last week and a half trying to get hold of this, this man who had been my boyfriend, father of my daughter, who had been my pimp. And she said, I managed to get hold of him on Facebook and through a friend managed to get his phone number. She said, the other night I phoned him. She said, I was so scared. I was so fearful. And she said, but I phoned him and I spoke to him. And she said, I told him about all the anger, all the hate, all the shame that I've walked with over these years. And she said, but then I ended off by saying, I want you to know that I forgive you, that I forgive you, that I don't hold this against you. And, and she said, um, it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. But she said, the most surprising reaction, he started crying, weeping on the phone. And it mentioned how for so long he had been trying to get hold of her to ask for her forgiveness and to repent of all the things that he had done to her over those years. And she said, for the first time I woke up the other day with a sense of lightness in my spirit, a sense of freedom, like a great big burden had been dropped from my back. My friends, that is maturity. That is hearing the message and then taking it and applying it and putting it into action in such a way that it, it changes me, it transforms me, it makes me more like Jesus. It's difficult, yimnazo, right? We've got to train ourselves, but it's worth it. Now the author changes track. He jumps into a, uh, into a warning in the next few verses. He's saying, if you don't mature, if you don't turn around and start changing and growing, there's a, a terrible cost. You, you might move beyond the ability to be redeemed. You might move beyond redemption. And so every time you reject Jesus, what you're doing is you're taking the sacrifice that he made and, and you're going back to these, to these old ways of doing things and what you're doing is you're taking the sacrifice of Jesus and you're exchanging it for a cheap and meaningless substitute. And there's gonna come a point when God will say enough. 
And so he gives this warning to try and urge and encourage them back to the right track. And we see that in the next few verses. There's the sense of hope that maybe his listeners will hear him and respond and turn and, and come back. We see it in, in the language that he uses. Chapter six and verse one, he says, therefore, leave behind the elementary message about Christ. Let us move on to maturity. Let's leave behind the bottle of milk and move on to the prime rib, right? Let's change, let's transform. In, in chapter six and verse nine, he goes on and he says, we are convinced of better things concerning you. This isn't an announcement of their doom that he's writing but rather it's an encouragement that there is something bigger, something better, something brighter that awaits you. And then we see it again in chapter six and verse 11. It says, we desire each one of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end in order that you may not be sluggish. There's an opportunity to turn around. You've slowed down, but it's time to speed up again, to pick up the pace, to move forward to change, to transform, to grow, to learn, to mature. I remember when I was at seminary, there were moments I went through when I became sluggish. And not just me, but others around me, when, when we were just getting our heads and our hearts full of all this Bible stuff and this talk about Jesus, and it was wonderful and it was good, but after a while it became so much that we lost sight of the prize and we began to slow down. And so as we move into the next part of this passage, the big question is, so what? We've heard all about this message, but so what? So what now? What do we do with this? What action should we take? You see, we face the same charge as the original readers and listeners of Hebrews. We too run the risk of become, becoming sluggish and slowing down. So this is not just a, a challenge for the, for the original listeners, it's a challenge for you and I this morning as well. It's an opportunity for us to, to time out, to take stock, and to see if we too have drifted from Jesus, lost sight of the goal, and become sluggish. And as I point my finger in you, at you, there's three fingers pointing back at me saying, Evans, have you checked your heart this morning? Does your heart still burn with that same passion for Jesus that it did in 1988, 22nd of September, when you gave your heart to Jesus? Does your heart still burn with passion as you, as you began to study the Bible and read about Jesus and you began to learn these amazing things? Does your heart still burn enough to compel you into some sort of action? And so before we go home today, I wanna just look at five characteristics very briefly. We're gonna breeze through them. Five characteristics that we see subtly hidden and woven in this passage that are necessary for us to mature and to grow and to learn. The first one is this. Uh, if I had to ask you, do you have what it takes? Do you have tenacity? Do you have tenacity? That's the sheer iron will determination to push on, to persevere, and to not give up. We see it in chapter six and verse 13 to, uh, and to 20. There's this idea of persevering and being unchanging in one's resolve. Have you lost sight of the prize or are you tenacious? Like a dog with a bow and I'm not gonna let it go. John Stott says it like this. He says, spiritual maturity is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. It's a process, it's a changing thing, but it takes tenacity to move forward to grasp it, to hold on to it. The second one is kind of similar, courage. Do you have courage? Because it takes courage to mature. As I said just now, Christianity and the Christian faith is not for the weak of heart. And so because it's not for the weak of heart, it takes courage when those moments of, of fear we press on. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. It's pressing on in spite of fear. I, I look at Jesus in Gethsemane. Three times he prays and he says, Father, if it's possible, take this from me. And then we see what happens over the next couple of days. He leans in, pushes in, pushes through. Why? Because of courage. So friends, we need tenacity, we need courage, but we also need humility. Do you have humility? Humility is that recognition that I need to grow, that recognition that I need to change. 
Uh, it's recognizing that there's things in me that are weak, that are slowing me down, that are holding me back, and, and I need to deal with those things for the sake of moving on and pushing forward. A businessman, Alan Cohen, puts it like this, personal growth or maturity is not a matter of just learning new information, but unlearning old limits or unlearning old habits. That takes humility. Fourthly, it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time. Maturity is not something that happens, uh, you know, instantly. It's not something that happens over a week or over a couple of days. In fact, if we, if we look at the, 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 the Christian growth, it's, it starts when we become Christians, or maybe it's even before that, there's influences in our lives that lead us to this point of salvation, but then the rest of our lives is about maturing and growing and, and becoming more and more and more like Jesus, and that takes time. But I don't want you to use time as a metric. I remember some, some years ago, we were looking at getting some elders for our church, and there was one elderly gentleman um, who was a Christian, at least I think he was. There were lots of things that made me wonder and doubt that at times, and Lord forgive me for that. But I, uh, he came to me and he said one day, I need to be an elder. You've got you've to put me up there, I need to be an elder. And I, and I said to him, well, you know, here's the process that we go through in, in seeking out and, and finding elders. And he said, nope. He says an elder means older. It's the oldest Christian, the one that's been a Christian for the longest period of time. Those are the ones that, are be, that become elders. But that's, time is not a metric. Uh, and someone much wiser than me put it like this. Spiritual maturity is not measured by how many years I've been a Christian, but by how much I've grown in the likeness of Christ. It's going to take time, but use that time wisely. And lastly, it's going to take faith. Do you have faith? You see, as a Christian, I cannot mature without Jesus speaking to me in such a way that my heart burns every time I open his word, every time I draw close to him in prayer, every time I, I come and worship him, every time I pick up my guitar and I wanna sing. And by the way, I'm a terrible guitarist. That's why I'm speaking today and not singing. It's not about, uh, it, we need Jesus in our lives. You're gonna get to chapter 12 in, in just a few weeks. And I wanna just point you to this scripture because it's all about faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You cannot mature or grow or become like Jesus without Jesus. He's our role model. So fix your eyes on Jesus, the originator, the perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In Prairie Bible College, I can tell you this, in the words of Paul to the Philippian church, I am confident of this. I am confident of this, that he who's begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Quick story, and then there's a little challenge I'm gonna leave you with this morning. When we finished our time at Cape Town Baptist Seminary, one of my friends gave his farewell speech at a chapel service very similar to this one. And he said this about Cape Town Baptist Seminary. He said, I've really enjoyed my time here at Cape Town Baptist Cemetery. <laughs> same reaction, same reaction. He didn't even smile, not a smile cracked those lips. And he said, because this is where I've learned to die to myself. I was like, oh, wow, I felt so bad about laughing. I hope you do as well, yeah. <laughs> Maturity in the Christian world is about learning to die to oneself. Let there be less of me so that there can be more of you. Less of me so that there can be more of you. I wanna give you an opportunity to respond this morning. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus or, or, or your faith journey. Maybe you felt like you've drifted a bit. Maybe uh, you've, you're just going through the motions and doing the right things, but your heart is just not there anymore and that and that fire is, has just sort of dimmed down and it's just a glowing ember now and, and you wanna grow, you would like to be where you were but you just don't know how to get there anymore. Well, I wanna pray for you this morning. I wanna encourage you that God will, 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 will reignite that, that flame and fan it into a bonfire, a, a passion, a fire within you so that there will be no stopping you. 
And so I'm going to encourage you to, if, if you felt that like God's speaking to you today, to stand up just where you are so I could pray for you. And by the way, standing up has got nothing to do with anyone else. Uh, it, it's about creating a milestone for yourself. Because when times get hard in the future, and they will, you can look back to this moment and say, that was where I took a stand. That's where I made a, a stand on what I believe, and I, I asked God to reignite the fire within my heart. It's creating a milestone that you can go back to that will refuel you for the journey ahead. So I'm going to invite you. Don't wait for others around you, but just take a stand. I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for you this morning. I'd like to pray for you. Father God, it's, it is all about dying to ourselves. And Lord, I, I love what you say in Romans chapter 12, that we are living sacrifices on the altar. The only problem with living sacrifices, Lord, is they want to crawl off the altar every now and again. And so it is with us. We lose sight of what you've called us to. We lose sight of why we started on this journey. We, we lose sight of, Lord, where you're taking us and where you're leading us. And, and Lord, we, we start to feel the passion dim within us and we begin to grow sluggish. But this morning, it's a turnaround moment, Lord, for us. It's an opportunity, Lord, for us to say, thus far and no more. I'll not move backwards anymore. I'm gonna move forwards from this moment on. And so, Lord, I want to pray for every person that's standing up, that's recognized within them, this desire to grow. They've, they've felt their hearts burning within them. It's compelled them to action. And, and Lord, they, they want to move forward with you. And so, Lord, we want to pray where there's sin, that you will bring forgiveness right now in the name of Jesus. Bring forgiveness, Lord. Where there's a need for conviction, Lord, would you stir our hearts within us that we would be convicted enough to confess that sin before you. Lord, where there's just a slowing down, a dimming of the fire, a growing sluggish in our walk with you, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us right here, right where we're at. That, Lord, that you would remind us of who you are, that you would give us a glimpse like you, you did the author of Hebrews. A glimpse of you, Jesus, a glimpse that would be so compelling, so full of life, so stirring that, Lord, we would not find ourselves able to slow down again. And, Lord, we take a vow this morning, right here, right now, to turn our hearts to you, to turn our, our hearts to, to where you want us to be, so that we can be the people you've called us to be in the name of Jesus. We speak against fear. We speak against the words of the enemy. We pray, Lord, that you would dim and close our minds to, to his influence into our lives so that all that is left is you, Jesus, and your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm, I'm going to share one last thing that I do, I did a long time ago. When Joshua crossed the river, uh, with the Israelites into the promised land. In the middle of the river, they stepped, stopped, they st uh, bent down, and they picked up stones, and they carried them out to the edge of the river, and they built there these monuments, these altars of remembrance, stones of remembrance. I want you to note that they hadn't yet got into the promised land. They were scared of that river, and in the middle of their anxiety, their fears, their failures, their discouragement, right there, God met them and spoke to them and gave them his promise. And so they picked up a stone, they carried it out, and they planted it down so that later on in years when their children or even when they began to doubt, they could look back and remember the promise of God, remember the works of God. Well, a long time ago, I did something similar. I carry a little stone in my pocket. And whenever I feel fear, like I did this morning sitting over there waiting for my opportunity to come up here, I, I, I reach into my pocket and I grab that stone and I remind myself of the promise and the calling of God on my life. So can I encourage you to do something this morning? When you leave here, just bend down, pick up a stone, put it in your pocket and your purse. If you're one of those people like uh, my daughters uh, spend a lot of time in front of the mirror, epoxy it to the mirror, you know, so that it's, it's, it's somewhere where you're going to see it and feel it often. So when you become discouraged, you can be reminded of God's promise on you, God's blessing 
on you. Thank you so much for having me this morning. I've so appreciated being with you. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you um, as you move on from here. And like uh, was mentioned, if you need to come and have a cup of coffee to talk about the Lower Pacific District and of the Evangelical Free Church, I'd love to do that with you. Thank you.